was arrested at 17 years old, and he continued to profess his innocence for nearly 30 years. And it turns out he was telling the truth. Of association. You know, my cousin got caught up in some criminal act, and because of our relationship, that's pretty much how we became connected. Mark Denny was 17 years old when he was charged with robbery and rape in Brooklyn, New York, and he was sentenced to 57 years in prison. Today, after spending 30 years behind bars and battling a lengthy court battle to prove his innocence, Denny is enjoying his freedom. He's just reached a settlement with the mayor's office and the NYPD, for which he'll receive nearly $10 million. It all began in December of 1987. On this unlucky day, Denny was listed as a suspect in a Burger King robbery and the rape of a female employee after being arrested in a vehicle driven by his cousin Raphael James. James had committed the series of robberies at several Burger Kings in the city, along with two other accused friends, Mark Smith and Eddie Vieta. Smith and Vieta eventually reached plea agreements for the charges against them, while James, who was tried and convicted with Denny, admitted that Denny wasn't involved in the crimes. Denny always claimed he was innocent. However, he was convicted after the victim pointed him out as a participant, even though she had not identified him at the beginning of the trial. There was no physical evidence connecting Denny to the crime. The woman's testimony was vague at trial, as during the assault, the men covered her eyes, and she was unsure whether there were three or four assailants. According to Mark Denny, the NYPD fabricated evidence that was presented to the prosecution through false written and oral reports and to the jury through false testimony during the trial. Evidence became the basis for convicting him. He also accuses them of failing to check his alibi, of willfully refusing to pursue other obvious leads, and of failing to find any DNA evidence at the crime scene that could inculpate him. Years later, the Innocence Project, an NGO that aims to defend innocent prisoners, took the case to the Kings County District Attorney's Conviction Review Unit, which ultimately determined that Denny wasn't at the Burger King that night. Denny was released in December of 2017 at the age of 46. After his release and careful consideration of the case, it was agreed to pay Mark Denny compensation of $9,750,000 from the state. Florida man walks free after 35 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. You were wrongly convicted of what? A rape charge. A rape charge. And you, and how many years were you actually sentenced? 20, 30, I mean, 25 mandatory with a life sentence. In 1974, James Bain, a 17-year-old teenager, was convicted of abusing a 9-year-old boy in Lakes Wales, Florida, after claiming at the time that he was at home with his sister watching television. The boy was abducted from his house, and he was taken by force to a baseball field, where the crime was committed by a person he described as having large sideburns and a mustache. A relative of the victim thought that the description sounded like James Bain. Bain's photo was included in a lineup of five photographs, and the victim picked Bain as his attacker. Bain had no criminal record at the time of his arrest, and insisted that he was at home watching television with his sister when the crime occurred. The defendant went to trial in May 1974, and it was there that the child pointed him out as the man who committed the crime. In addition, according to FBI analysis, the criminal did leave semen on the victim's underwear. The trial occurred before DNA testing was available, so Bain couldn't have definitively been tied to this evidence. An FBI analyst testified that the semen on the underwear, from three different stains, was of blood group B. Bain was an AB secretor, which should have excluded him. Instead, the analyst claimed Bain's blood group was weak A, and thus he couldn't be excluded from being guilty. This wasn't supported by testing. An expert for the defense testified that Bain's group had a strong A, so that he could be definitively excluded. On May 23rd of 1974, Bain was sentenced to life in prison. In 2001, Bain began seeking DNA testing of evidence from the crime, but was unsuccessful until the Innocence Project of Florida, accepting his case in 2005. In 2009, DNA testing of the evidence showed no match between Bain and the biological material left at the crime scene by the perpetrator. As a result, Bain was released on December 17th of 2009, after prosecutors filed a motion to vacate his conviction and sentence. 
He had spent 35 years in prison for a crime that he never committed. More than any other person exonerated through DNA testing in the United States. In 2011, the state of Florida awarded him $1.75 million in compensation. 17 years behind bars for a brutal crime they say they did not commit. Well, tonight, two Clark County men are free and they're starting over again. New DNA analysis prompts a Clark County judge to throw out the rape convictions against Alan Northrup and Larry Davis. 17 years gone, never to be regained. Got a lot of catching up to do. It was 1993 when a woman who was working as a housekeeper was intercepted and raped by two men. A tip led the cops to include Alan Northrup and Larry Davis as suspects in this crime. Although the victim couldn't have seen her abusers because she was blindfolded, she pointed to these two men as responsible for the crime. As a result, Alan and Larry spent 16 years in prison until they allowed DNA evidence to be used in trials. Thus, after allowing this type of evidence, Northrup and Davis were able to prove their innocence. On the morning of January 11th of 1993, the victim was cleaning a home in La Center, Washington, when the men broke in. They struggled with the woman before blindfolding her with tape. Next, they tied her legs to a kitchen table, threatened her with a knife, and cut off her clothes. Afterwards, they committed the crime. The men left immediately after the attack, and nothing was stolen from the house. Because the victim had been blindfolded for the attack, the only detail that she could recall for sure about her attackers was that one had dark hair and one was blonde. The police released descriptions of the perpetrator to the public. Two men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair. Someone called in, stating that Larry W. Davis and his friend, Alan G. Northrup, were friends in the area who fit the profile. They immediately became suspects and were placed in photo arrays shown to the victim. Despite telling the police that she could only remember a hair color from the victim, or sorry, from the perpetrator, the victim made a tentative photo identification of Davis, but didn't identify a second person. Afterwards, she was presented with a live lineup that included both men, identifying both as the attackers. Davis and Northrop were the only suspects who appeared in the photo and the live lineups, potentially making their faces more familiar to her and increasing her chances of recognizing them. Additionally, a friend of the victim had provided her with details about the questioned suspects right before the lineups occurred. Based on the victim's identification, Davis and Northrop were charged with committing the attack. In addition, Northrop was charged as the rapist and Davis as the accomplice. In May of 1993, the jury found Larry Davis guilty of first-degree kidnapping, first-degree burglary, and being an accomplice to first-degree rape. He was sentenced to 20 years and six months in prison. Two months later, a different jury found Alan Northrop guilty of first-degree kidnapping, first-degree burglary, and first-degree rape. He was sentenced to 23 years and three in six months. Davis and Northrop contacted the Innocence Project Northwest by mail in 2000. At the time, the state's DNA testing gave prosecutors the ultimate decision on whether to grant DNA testing in closed cases. The Clark County Prosecutor's Office opposed the test for almost six years, while Davis and Northrop waited behind bars. The law was changed in 2005 to give judges the power to order post-conviction testing. The Innocence Project Northwest filed a motion in 2006 seeking DNA tests on evidence from the case. Clark County Superior Court Judge Robert Harris granted testing. After the court ordered testing, however, the shirt and pants worn by the victim during the assault were destroyed by the Clark County Sheriff's Office before DNA testing could be conducted on the evidence. Tests proceeded on other crime scene evidence, including swabs in the rape kit containing sperm cells and fingernail scrapings taken from the victim after the crime. The results revealed consistent profiles of two unknown men, including Northrop and Davis. Davis and Northrop continued to fight for dismissal based on these results. Davis was released on probation in January of 2010, three years before his expected termination of his sentence. Four months later, on April 21st of 2010, Judge Diane Wooland overturned the men's conviction based on the DNA results. And on July 14th of 2010, prosecutors officially dismissed the charges against Larry Davis and Alan Northrup, and they were acquitted. In September of 2013, after 10 days of trial before a federal jury, Clark County, Washington agreed to pay Alan Northrup and Larry Davis 
$1.5 billion for wrongfully convicting and imprisoning them for 17 years for a crime neither of them committed. Henry McCollum and Leon Brown were convicted of assaulting and killing 11-year-old Sabrina Bowie. That was in North Carolina in 1983, and they got the death penalty. But a cigarette found near the victim tied the crime to an already convicted killer. Well, the courtroom broke out in a standing ovation when the judge tossed out the convictions yesterday. Henry McCollum and Leon Brown, two half-brothers with intellectual disabilities, were indemnified with $75 million by a North Carolina jury. The two paid more than 30 years in prison while innocent. In 1984, when Henry and Leon were both wrongfully convicted of the abuse and murder of an 11-year-old girl, Elliot Abrams, the attorney of the two brothers, said in an interview with the New York Times that two police officers forced them to confess to the crime. During a late-night interrogation lasting more than five hours, police officers Leroy Allen and Kenneth Sneed forced the detainees to plead guilty. By that time, Henry McCollum was 19 years old, but the mental capacity was that of a nine-year-old boy. The officers told him that they would take him to a gas chamber if he didn't confess to the crime. A, a gas chamber. Instead, McCollum was sentenced to death and Brown to life imprisonment. During the investigations into the case of the abused and murdered girl, police officers went to Roscoe Artist's home. The officers at the time didn't investigate his background, and a couple of questions were enough to disassociate him from the investigation. Later, the subject committed another femicide. This time, the victim was an 18-year-old woman with whom he assaulted. All of this happened while the two brothers, Henry McCollum and Leon Brown, were awaiting sentencing. Artis was sent to jail for this crime. However, years later, the subject confessed to committing a crime similar to the 11-year-old girl for which the two brothers were in prison. In 2014, the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission ordered a DNA analysis of a cigarette butt found at the crime scene. Ultimately, the results showed that the DNA on the cigarette butt belonged to Roscoe Artis. Days later, a Superior Court judge overturned the convictions against Henry McCollum and Leon Brown. The Raleigh, North Carolina jury awarded both men a million dollars each year they spent in prison while innocent. To this sum, the judge decided to grant them a total of 13 million dollars for punitive damages. Para Adrián Sarricueta, el año 2013 marcó su vida. Fue acusado de violación pese a que alegó inocencia en un tribunal. Pasó 79 días preso y solo quedó en libertad tras un examen de ADN. It was in the early morning of January 20th of 2013 when DPVC boarded a collective cab of Line 21 of La Serena, Chile. The young woman was on vacation but had gone out dancing with some friends. The same ones who had dropped her off at the bus stop. They had hoped that she would return home, safe and sound, but that didn't happen. While she was in the passenger seat, the driver left the route, went to a vacant lot, and threatened her with what appeared to be a firearm. She was to hand over her phone and her money. Once again, he intimidated her. He pointed what could have been a gun at her head, and he raped her. She was forced back onto the bus. He again demanded that he hand over her valuables, her cell phone and 3,000 pesos in cash. They struggled, but the victim could escape and file the corresponding complaint. According to the case file published by the Republic Defender's Office, when the victim reported the incident, she didn't remember details of the defendant's face, only general characteristics, such as height, hair color, and physical build. Despite this, the police also drew up a sketch of the alleged assailant. To this, she added other details. The car where she suffered the aggression had a bad horn and belonged to the bus line North Degree 21. With this last background, the police obtained the driver's photographs, who worked for the transport company mentioned above. Among them was a photo of Adrian Zaracueta Toro, who hadn't been working as a driver for six months because he was working for a construction company in the north of the country. However, the young victim recognized him as her aggressor. She was 90% sure, she said, which started a legal process that ended with the accused behind bars. He was formalized for the crime of robbery with rape, and was remanded in custody for 79 days. Despite the accusation, Zarrecueta was adamant about his innocence. On the same day of his arraignment, July 29th of 2013, he agreed to the extraction of genetic material for DNA testing. The results only arrived on October 7th. Nevertheless, they were enlightening. The coincidence of the genetic material found in the victim and her clothes that were extracted from the accused was ruled out. 
Adrian Zaracueta Toro was innocent. Due to the new background, on October 15th of 2013, the prosecutor in charge of the investigation had no choice but to request a hearing to review the remand of the accused, which took place on October 16th of 2013, when he was released. After his release, the PDI managed to find a cell phone salesman who was the perpetrator of the robbery and the rape, of which DPVC was the victim. Thus, in 2016, Zarakoita joined the Proyecto Inocentes of the Public Criminal Defense Office. This initiative seeks economic reparation for those innocent people who were imprisoned due to the state's error. This judicial struggle lasted several years, until recently the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the affected party. According to the ruling, the third chamber of the highest court established the responsibility of the state for the deficient and passive actions of the public prosecutor's office during the investigation period. Also, for the excessive delay in delivering the DNA tests that proved ex exculpatory, and in requesting a hearing to revoke the preventative detention once it had the report in its possession. It was a long process, but we were confident. It is said that one is innocent until proven guilty, but in my case, that wasn't the case. Therefore, I feel the prosecutor's office should investigate better, says Adrian Zaracueta today, in a statement released this afternoon by the DPP and the Pro Bono Foundation. For all of this, the Treasury will have to pay a compensation of 40 million pesos to an innocent man who went to jail by mistake. <laughs>